so what, what is life? But this will be what is water, rather. And water, I mean, that's everywhere. We, we live on the blue planet. But how much water is there on Earth? Here's the answer. If we collect all the water in the oceans, lakes, rivers, underground, it's a sphere 860 miles in diameter, so it's not that much. Now, that's all salt water, but if we go to fresh liquid water, it's 169.5 miles in diameter. And if we think about freshwater lakes and rivers, which is where we normally take our drinking water, well, there it is. So, a challenge for the future will be really access to clean, potable water. And in order to clean the water, I mean, I think we, we need to understand its properties and what gives the, the anomalous properties. Anomalous, <coughs> that's, that means basically unusual if you compare with other liquids. And typically, when a liquid solidifies, it becomes more dense. But for water, the ice is floating on top. And this is important for life here in the north, that the ice forms at the surface and forms an insulating layer. But it's also important that water has a density maximum at four degrees. So up here, it's zero, basically, or one degree. But at the bottom, it's four. So, And that's an uh, anomalous property. I mean, most liquids will just increase the density linearly with decreasing temperature. So we can look at the specific heat of water. That's another way in w which water is different from most other liquids. It, can, it takes much more energy to change the temperature one degree. Now, why is that important? Well, the energy transport, we're dependent on it here up north. The Gulf Stream can carry enormous amounts of energy up north to us. We have the boiling point of water. So if we <coughs> just continue this series of similar compounds, we would expect water to have a boiling point around minus 60 or minus 70 degrees. But it's plus 100. Similarly, the melting point of ice is anomalous. And we need to understand the origin of these properties. This surface tension of water is also higher than other liquids. So if we compare a droplet of ethanol and a droplet of water, the water likes to bind more to other water molecules than to the surface. So it curves up, while ethanol doesn't have the same property. So what is the origin of this? Well, the simple answer is, of course, hydrogen bonding, right? Now, the hydrogen bond is basically electrostatic. So we have a positive charge on the protons and a negative charge on the, on the oxygen. Oxygen is more electronegative and pulls the electrons, so we have a dipole. But it's not only electrostatics, because you can improve the electrostatic, the attraction, by rearranging the electron density. So instead of the lone pair, the negative charge on the oxygen being attracted and shifting towards the positive proton, it moves away. And then the positive proton can come closer, and that strengthens the bond. But that type of rearrangement becomes enhanced if you form chains or rings of water. So that strengthens the, the hydrogen bonding, and we call it cooperativity. But there's also an anti-cooperativity. So if we have formed a chain, or well, two molecules like this and in a chain, if we try to add a third molecule, that's not very favorable unless you add another at the same time. So pairwise, 
donated, accepted, accepted, donated. And it's strong enough to give structure. So this is a chiral a chain of water molecules in, in the minor groove of DNA, which has recently been seen also in solution. But it's also weak enough to give flexibility. So how can we investigate this? And now comes my challenge. I, I'm, I'm used to talking to physicists and people well, like myself. <laughs> so now I have to try to explain a little bit about the techniques that we use uh, to investigate how the molecules arrange themselves in the liquid. And we're using mainly, and I should mention, so Ingmar mentioned already Anders Nilsson, and so he's the person doing the experiments brilliant uh, scientist. In X-ray spectroscopy, we come in with an X-ray photon, and here it's of the order of 540 electron volts, so to get the 1s electron from the oxygen in absorption here to go up into empty states here. Now, if you look at the water molecule, these are the bonding and another bonding orbital, and then we have the lone pair uh, orbital that goes out of the plane. Now, oxygen is more electronegative, so it pulls the electrons towards it, which means that the empty orbitals up here are pulled or pushed over towards the hydrogens. And that means that when you come up with an electron from here up to here, it will be very sensitive to what the hydrogens are doing. So we can really look at the hydrogen bonding. The 1s orbital is a tiny thing. And in order to go from here to some other place, you have to have a connection between. You have to have an overlap with this tiny thing, which means that it becomes a very, very local. We can look at the environment around individual molecules. Now, we make a hole here, and it's 500 electron volts excited. So that doesn't live very long. I mean, 3 to 4 ten times 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And then an electron will fall down. And when a photon, an X-ray photon, is emitted here, we get a direct measurement of the occupied orbitals. Now, the tool here is a synchrotron. So you generate electrons, shoot them into a ring where you accelerate them, and then take them out into a storage ring. Now, these things here are so-called undulators. I will come back to, to that. So they're magnets that shift the poles. And when the electrons go through there, it's like the Earth's magnetic field, which the, the, uh, makes the char <coughs> charged cosmic rays deviate and follow the lines. So they start to wiggle, and when they wiggle, they emit light. And that light is then led out to these experimental stations. Okay? Now, we weren't interested in water. We had big funding to, to look at biomimetic enzyme catalysis. We wanted to do nitrogenase, so our background is in surface science, and we wanted to build something that would work as nitrogenase on a metal surface. And we wanted to use hydrogen bonding. We looked at glycine on this copper surface, and in our proposals we called it a model of proteins interacting with metal implantate in the human body. But at, in ultra-high vacuum, better vacuum than between Earth and the Moon, and at 100 Kelvin, so minus, well, I mean, 163 degrees, or, well, very cold. So we needed water, but that's a really bad combination with ultra-high vacuum. But Anders solved it, and we wanted to look at these amino acids and proteins in water solution. But then we needed a background water spectrum because most of the molecules were water. And to see the, the, the background, 
the, 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 the biomolecules, we need to subtract the background. But then it turned out that the background was more interesting than what we were trying to see. Are you familiar with blow up? So a photographer is out, takes pictures, and when he comes back and blows him up, he has caught a murder on, on film or the fo in the photo. So to explain wh why, why the background was more interesting, I mean, the, 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 I have to explain a little bit about how we get these uh, peaks and their positions. So basically, we're, we're looking at the empty states. And they are the antibony states. This, will, this is a cartoon where a molecule, well, an atom here and an atom there combine to make a bonding orbital which goes down in energy, and then antibony orbitals that are empty and go up in energy. How much they split depends on the distance, the interaction. Now, if water were like ice, mostly tetrahedral, but with disorder, we would have a big variation in distances. And we would expect to see, if this is the eye spectrum, then with some disorder it would be, and it would basically be smeared out. That's what you would expect. But here's how it looks. Totally different from the eyes. So we, let me do this first. This is a dominating peak in the eyes. So that would correspond to hydrogen bonds. And we can confirm that by looking at the temperature difference. So this position here, that would be the position in the ice. If we heat it, that intensity goes down. Instead, this intensity goes up. And so we have temperature-dependent changes here. We did a lot of simulations. If we calculate from ice structures, we get ice. If we have four hydrogen bonds and distorted, we looks like ice. If we break bonds on the backside of the molecule, it still looks like ice. But if we have a situation where we have only one of the hydrogens bonding and the other basically free, then we get these features. So Anders then could go back into the surface science lab and build a thin ice film on, on a platinum substrate. And looking straight down into this film, you get a spectrum like this. If you look along the surface, where you have molecules that just have one hydrogen bond and the other pointing towards vacuum, we get this peak. And to make sure that we were looking at the right thing, Anders put on a layer of ammonia. So that terminates and uh, water can hydrogen bond to ammonia, and then it becomes like in the bulk. But these X-rays are atom-specific. I mean, the absorption of oxygen and ammonia are separated by 100 eV or so. So it doesn't contribute to the spectrum, but it shifts, and you get basically the ice spectrum. So here we have hydrogen bonds, here we have broken bonds. But there are much fewer tetrahedral than expected from the textbook picture. Now, if we look in the other spectroscopy, X-ray emission spectroscopy, then if we look at the gas phase, we see these orbitals. We see the lone pair, which is very sharp, because it, it, it's not bonding internally in the molecule. But the bonding orbitals get smeared out because when you take out a one-s electron from the oxygen, it essentially becomes like a fluorine. And fluorine is not very happy in the geometry of water, so you get a lot of excitations. Here's the ice. And here we have water at increasing temperatures. So here we have two peaks in the insensitive part of the spectrum. And we have a temperature dependence also. So here we blow up just this region. And what we can see here is that we have one peak which is close to the position of the peak in ice. So this is the tetrahedral component in the liquid. And we have another peak 
which when we heat goes more and more towards the peak in, in the gas phase. I mean, in the gas phase, we don't have hydrogen bonds. So here we have distorted peak, uh, distorted mole molecules with distorted hydrogen bonding. And when we heat, they get more and more loosely bound, moving towards breaking the hydrogen bonds. But there's no broadening of these when we, for the, when we heat. If you do a simulation of the liquid, and there's no simulation that actually gives the correct structure as we see it. Things just broaden with temperature. But here, they remain sharp, and the intensity, relative intensity, proportions change. So, either tetrahedral or very disordered. Okay, th this may be... So here we have the X-ray absorption, here we have the X-ray emission, just comparing 90 degrees and 10 degrees, and they both depend on temperature. But X-ray emission follows absorption. So we can choose the, the energy. So we can, if we take the excitation way up here, it's not sensitive to structure. So we can have that as reference. And that's the, the gray here. If we excite here at the post edge, we're preferentially selecting tetrahedral molecules. And then we enhance this peak here, which corresponds to this one here. If we excite at the pre-edge, which we have said is due to broken hydrogen bonds, we only get one peak, this one here, which is the one that increases with increase in temperature. So we can selectively look at tetrahedral molecules and molecules with broken hydrogen bonds. There seems to be a bimodal structural distribution. It's either or. Now, the tetrahedral ones, they lose intensity with temperature, but the peak is fi at, at fixed energy, which means they don't get really thermally excited. They're either there, pretty stiff, or break up. The other ones, they gain intensity and disperses. So they get thermally excited, so vibrating more and more, loosening up the hydrogen bond network. So it's a basically a competition between enthalpy and entropy. Enthalpy, making hydrogen bonds. Entropy, breaking hydrogen bonds, close packing. So the tetrahedral would correspond to a lower density liquid. So at ambient temperatures, this would mean fluctuation. So local structures either trying to make hydrogen bonds at ambient temperatures, around 20 to 30 percent of them, or a higher density uh, liquid, which try to close pack as much as possible. And of course, it's always a question of, a, of minimizing the free energy. So either by making hydrogen bonds or by introducing disorder. And the thing is, at the ambient temperatures, water cannot decide which way to go. So it's basically this soup of disorder, close packing molecules. But you find a lower energy if you make the hydrogen bonds ice-like. So some molecules get into that, and then they collapse again. Now, how to look at this? And now I have to... So we're using X-ray scattering now to, to... or diffraction to look at the structure in the liquid. And basically, we come in with, with these like plane waves. We get the diffraction pattern here. And the, 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 the positions of these interference uh, peaks depends on the distance between these. So there's a sensitivity. If, this, if the distance is short, then we get a wide uh, distribution. And if the distance is large, then the distribution is more at small angles. Okay? What we get out of this is a pair distribution function. So this is the probability, if I'm sitting here at this molecule, and I'm looking out at different radii. Where do I find other molecules? And I count them. I can 
I get this type of distribution. So these are the first neighbors and that will correspond to just this distance here between them, around 2.8 angstrom. Here we have a peak which is connected to tetrahedral coordination because it's the peak between the second neighbors here. And then we have another peak and with this type of data that we have available today. So it's very long range. I'll, I'll just say one thing mathematica math mathematical. So you measure in Q space and you do a Fourier transform to R space. And the farther you, you measure in Q space, the farther you can go in R space, basically. Now, we see a temperature dependence. So this peak really grows when we supercool. But there's a very interesting aspect here when we look at the positions of the peaks. So this is the position of the first peak here in the oxygen-oxygen correlation. And when we heat the liquid, it's just a linear expansion, a thermal expansion of the liquid. And that's, a, that's true also for the second shell, but only up to about 46 degrees. And then something happens. We lose, basically, the second shell. And the second shell is connected to the tetrahedrality. That's this distance here. And what's interesting now is that the compressibility shows a minimum at 46 degrees. And then it starts to, to grow here. So things begin to happen around 46 degrees. We can look in more detail when we have these fantastic data going so far out. So we can actually analyze in the experiment as, as a function of temperature, even out to 18 angstrom, and we find structures out there. And those structures are temperature dependent. So as the 4.5 angstrom, that, that's the second tetrahedral shell, starts to grow, then we also get a peak at 9 angstrom, and at 11 angstrom comes up pretty markedly here. So what happens is that water becomes correlated. You get larger fluctuations. And we can look at them with small angle X-ray scattering. But now we're going to look one nanometer. I mean, that's 10 angstrom. And we're having a probe, which is much smaller than that, and we're going to try to see the correlation between you and you out there. And this is my probe. And I'm going to throw this photon at you, and I can get the correlation between you and you if I make this bounce off of you and onto you and then to the detector. But the probability is very low in this geometry. So if I go to small angle, then I can line you up. And if I now throw it, I'm not going to, then I have a high probability of seeing the correlation between you. So going to small angle fools the, well, I mean, you, 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 you can see long distances even though you have a, 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 a small probe. And when we do that, <coughs> here's a normal liquid, ethanol does not have, I mean, if you remember the, the, the image with the water droplet and the ethanol, it doesn't have the anomalous properties of water. And if we compare the small angle signal, we see that, that the behavior with temperature is very different. Now, the interesting, an interesting part here is the intercept at zero, because that is connected to the isothermal compressibility. And for water, I show the curve going up, and that corresponds to the increase here. But we can also interpret this increase in terms of a correlation length. And from the correlation length, we can get the size of the density, I mean, the, the size of the region where the density is different. And that's of the order one nanometer. So what we see is basically that water becomes a correlated material below about 50 degrees. What that means is that we get fluctuations that grow 
And at ambient temperature, it's of the order of one nanometer. And as we supercool the liquid, they grow in size. But they're fluctuations. So water molecules trying to get into ice-like or tetrahedral hydrogen bonding situations and collapsing again. So a very simple picture would be that we have high density liquid, and then at some point it will be low density liquid, and you get fluctuations when water cannot decide which way to go. And this will be connected to the funnel that, that's in the title. Okay. So here we have the isothermal compressibility. For a typical liquid, it goes just decreasing linearly with decreasing temperature. But for water, we have a minimum at 46 degrees. And it's dependent on density fluctuations. So that's what we looked at now. But we also have the heat capacity. For a typical liquid, again, just a straight line. Water has a higher heat capacity than normal liquids. And there's a minimum around body temperature. And as we cool down further, it goes up. And it seems to diverge towards the temperature of minus 45 degrees. And this divergence would be typical of a critical point. Now, think about a pressure cooker. Okay, the, the normal boiling point when water is in equilibrium with the uh, gas is in equilibrium with the liquid will be 100 degrees at normal pressure. You can increase it by using a pressure cooker. So at higher pressure, the water will boil maybe at 110 degrees. And you can go higher and higher, but you come to a point basically where the pressure cooker explodes, but where, where this coexistence line ends. And it ends in a critical point where these fluctuations, where it cannot decide which way to go, become basically infinite. And that's typical that these depends on death fluctuations, entropy fluctuations, and at the critical point, they, they, they diverge. Now, could there be a critical point? And if you think about it, here you would have divergence. Now, very close to the critical point, you're, you're, they're, they're very localized. But as you move away from it, into this coexistence region, they become, let me show it here. So at the critical point, this could be any response function, compressibility or heat capacity, it's very, very sharp. And the boundary is very narrow. When you move out here, it becomes less sharp and it broadens out, like a funnel here. And basically, we see that, that these fluctuations start around 46 degrees that, or 50 degrees. That's the minimum in compressibility. And then it starts to grow because the fluctuations grow. So could there be a liquid-liquid critical point somewhere here between a high-density liquid and a low-density liquid? The problem is that minus 45 degrees, I mean, that would be in what's called no man's land, because it's so difficult to make experiments there on liquid water at minus 45 degrees. So you have to, because water crystallizes so rapidly, so you have to measure very rapidly. And for this, we use an X-ray free electron laser. And this is a LINAC coherent light source at SLAC in California. So you have, this used to be an electron accelerator for particle physics experiments, and now it's, it's a photon machine, so it's an X-ray laser. So the X-rays are generated and then taken to these experimental stations. So it's two kilometers long. You have an enormous number of photons in each pulse of this laser. And the pulse length is of the order five to 500 femtoseconds. Now, the difference here, this, this would be 
what I showed before, the undulator, where you have north pole, south pole, and reverse. And you inject the electrons, and they start to eject, uh, emit light. Now, in the free electron laser, you have a very long undulator. And you have shorter bunches of electrons. And what happens is that you get the emission, but then the emission starts to interact with the electrons. And the electrons in the bunch start to order themselves up. And you get the lasing effect and an enormous enhancement. And this is what, what's being used now for the experiments. So here's the undulator hole. It's 132 meters long. So you have to cool very rapidly and measure very rapidly. So you inject water droplets, there are 10 microns in diameter, into vacuum. And then you hit with these X-ray pulses. And you get a diffraction pattern from individual water droplets. And if, if they are liquid, it will look like this. If they have crystallized, you get Bragg spots, like in protein cr crystallography. <coughs> now, it's amazing, really. I mean, you have this two kilometer long X-ray laser that shows bullets that are about one micron. And you're trying to hit water droplets in vacuum that are 10 microns. And you can actually do it. But you come in with 10 to the 12 photons. So after the measurements, I mean, you've destroyed the sample. But you get the data before it's destroyed. So here's how the droplets cool. So in a few milliseconds, we're down below 200, below where nobody had been able to go before. We're in no man's land. You see crystallization beginning around 228 Kelvin. But we still have water droplets, some water droplets down here at 227. And what we see is a change in tetrahedrality, which is accelerated when we go down below 240 Kelvin, so minus 33. So we see a transformation more and more towards a tetrahedral low density like liquid. Now, this is what we did. We went from normal water and down into no man's land, trying to see the hypothetical continuation of a coexistence line here. And we saw the rise up but we didn't see any dramatic changes. So there cannot be a, a critical point here. But maybe further into no man's land. But to get there, we are now going to go the other way. We're coming from below. So there are two forms of amorphous ISIS, a low density amorphous and a high density amorphous. Between these two, there's a first order phase transition. And the question is, does this continue up in here? So we're going to go from here and then cross over. And here's a piece of high density amorphous ice that we've just taken out of vacuum, uh, out of, <laughs> sorry, the high pressure cell kept under liquid nitrogen and then put on the table, and I'm standing there with my cell phone. And the density difference is big. So the volume, when you go from high density amorphous to low density, increases by 25%. And here the transformation begins. And we actually call this popcorn eyes. Was the smoke that seemed to come out in the beginning? Well, it's cold. Cold? Yeah, I mean, we take it out from liquid nitrogen and put it on the table. Mm. So, we're going, going to follow this now. Wax, that's X-ray diffraction. So, 
That's wide angle X-ray diffraction. So with that, we, we can see shorter distances. And we can see the difference between high density amorphous and low density amorphous because the ring that we see has different uh, diameter. But we are at the same time going to look with small angles. And there we will see uh, larger distances. And we're going to look at dynamics in something called X-ray photon correlation spectroscopy, which I will explain here. Now, this is really twinkle, twinkle, little star. So when you look at the star at night, you see it twinkles. And that's because there are density variations in the atmosphere, wind and some turbulence. And so it goes through different densities. There's motion in the atmosphere. And that means, makes the, the star position shift a little bit. Ta -dum, ta -dum. And it's the same thing here. When we come in with the X-rays, if things are very, very static, and we have some density inhomogeneities in the liquid, then we don't get this uh, smooth ring. We get spots. But if things move while we measure, then those spots will go in different positions, and they will smear out. So by looking at how sharp and well-defined are these spots, then we can say something about the dynamics. And what we want to know is, in the transformation that we saw, does it go directly from one form of ice to another form of ice, or does it become a liquid before and turn to liquid and then go back to, to the ice? So here's the data, sort of. What this means is that, that it's, it's a direct conversion. I mean, we go from a high-density form to a low-density form, and it's relatively sharp. And we can actually measure a diffusion constant which is temperature dependent. And I'm, I'm not going to say more than that, but, but based on this, I mean, it's, it's very, very cold, so it's very viscous, so it's slow diffusion, but it does behave as a liquid. And basically, here's a cartoon. We start with high density amorphous ice. This is a density scale. Red is low density, blue is high density. We get some dynamics. We get conversion between uh, different in different regions. We have inhomogeneities, but we have diffusion, and then it converges conver converts to the low density li liquid. So we have structural fluctuations in water. In normal liquids, it's just thermal fluctuations. And those structural fluctuations become important when we go below like 50 degrees or so. And they grow as we cool more and more. And it seems we do have pure, pure high-density liquid. I mean, when we come from below and we can convert to a low-density liquid, so we've seen that uh, coexistence line. And the question now is, is there a liquid-liquid critical point there in the no man's land? But w w w with this picture, it, it becomes very simple to understand the anomalous properties of water. So the density maximum, I mean, if you think in terms of two simple liquids, a high-density form and a low-density form, which both increase their density as you cool them. But you have a transition from one to the other in some region. Then you increase the density, increase the density, and you start to pick up the low density component, and you switch over, and then you decrease the density as it becomes more and more of the low density. Ice floats. Well, the liquid is dominated by the high density. 
while the ice is more like the low density. The heat capacity, well, it depends on fluctuations. For water, we don't just have the normal thermal fluctuations, but we also have structural fluctuations that give increased entropy. And the surface tension, boiling point, melting point, well, hydron bonding. And the, the molecules at the surface, I mean, they, they will prefer, I mean, try to bind more down rather than to the air above. So, to summarize, water is not a complicated liquid. It's really two simple liquids, but with a complicated relationship. And so here's a group. We're over at Albanova. And here's Anders Nilsson and the rest of the team. And that's the story. Thank you.